I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Oh, we're being recorded. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, Navigating Connecticut's New EV and Energy Storage Programs. Today, we are joined by representatives from the state's Public Utility Regulatory Authority. We've got a great group lined up to talk about those programs. So before we dig in, I'd like to just give a little overview of Sustainable CT and our new Climate Leader Designation Program. In case anybody's new to those, so I'm going to share a screen here. Hopefully everyone sees that. Uh, maybe you do. Uh, do folks see my, my PowerPoint or do you see the presentation mode? Hopefully we're good. All right, so to anyone who's new to Sustainable CT, Sustainable CT is a statewide municipal certification program intended to help Connecticut cities and towns advance their overall sustainability. And we take a, a pretty broad look at sustainability. So we're thinking about arts and culture, transportation, public health, housing, local businesses, land and natural resources, really everything that makes a community a place where people want to live, work, and play. And at the core of the program, we have a menu of actions that cities and towns can pick from to work on to get points that will count towards their certification. There's no one-size-fits-all way to navigate sustainable CT. There's really a lot of flexibility. Um, cities and towns can pick actions that make sense to them that speak to their unique local character. We do have different resources available to registered towns in the program. Things like this, an informational webinar where we're going to share uh, information about a really cool program for cities and towns and others. We have a community match fund. We have different technical supports where communities can work with consultants at no cost to do certain actions. We do want to help you along the way. And cities and towns participating in Sustainable CT define what success looks like in the program. Perhaps you want to attain one of our two levels of certification. Perhaps you'd like to be considered a climate leader. Perhaps you'd just like to work on a couple actions every year and advance your sustainability and, and reap those benefits from those actions. And that's fine too. We're in, we're in it with you, um, and we're here to help. I mentioned we take a very broad look at sustainability, and you can see here are 12 different action categories. We've got 68 actions and hundreds of sub-actions that fall within these 12 different categories. You can see local economies, land and natural resources, materials management, health and wellness, and so on. Each action is essentially a sustainability best practice, and we lay out all the steps that your community would take to achieve that action, things you would need to submit to us, as well as different resources that are available. For those that are in the program, these steps will look quite recognizable. And if your community is not in Sustainable CT yet, you can join at any time. We currently have 129 of the state's 169 towns in Sustainable CT, and we're so excited about that. Um, for communities to join, they pass a resolution, they get a group of people together to work on their application or to work on action. Uh, again, you define success and then you, you work to achieve whatever success looks like for you. If certification is one of your goals, we have two levels of certification in 2022. And if you're wondering where gold is, we've got bronze and silver, where the heck is gold? It's on the way. So we are releasing gold in 2023, we are excited about that. Uh, but we do have another element in 2022 that is open to cities and towns. We have a special climate leader designation. We are piloting this designation this year. We will learn a lot from you, with you. And if you have comments and feedback, whether you're working through the climate leader designation or not, we would love to hear from you. And we'll put an email address in the chat where you can send your feedback. But essentially what the climate leader designation does is it's recognizing cities and towns that are taking great strides, strides to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So what we've done is identify high impact actions that are existing within the sustainable CT framework. Towns can work and pick from those actions. So again, lots of flexibility, score 140 points within those actions, and you are a climate leader. So that's what we're piloting in 2022. We are excited about that. And again, we're gonna learn a lot from and with you as you move through this. This climate leader designation is voluntary and it would be on top of being a bronze or silver uh, certified community. And that's, you know, we can get into any of those details in, in the Q&A session at the end of this um, presentation if you do have questions. But again, we're interested in your feedback. You would email info at sustainablect.org 
if you have thoughts on the climate leader designation. And I will say we are focusing on mitigation right now. So we are focusing on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing your carbon pollution. We recognize that resilience is a paramount of paramount importance. Uh, we need to do more work to build more resilience-related actions into the sustainable CD framework. So if you have thoughts on what those actions could be, please send them along. So right now we're focusing on carbon pollution, and here are the list of actions down to the sub-action that are open to towns who are interested in the climate leader designation. Of course, you can work on any actions in the program. These are the ones, though, we score 140 points within this block, and you would be considered a climate leader in 2022. As part of the climate leader designation rollout, we have a webinar series that we've been running throughout the year. We've had two sessions. This is our third. We're really excited about it. And we have a suite of uh, webinars coming up. And I just want to highlight them because they're pretty exciting. So on Earth Day, we have representatives from Project Drawdown speaking at our coffee hour. So register if you're interested. This should be really interesting and exciting and will ground us in the why. Why is this important right now? Why do we need to work on the climate emergency at this moment? Um, on May 5th, we're going to be joined by the Connecticut Green Bank to talk about the CPACE program. May 17th, we have representatives from the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection talking about resources open to towns to manage woodlands and urban forests. On June 14th, we have other people from DEEP talking about tracking solid waste generation in their community. And we also have someone from the town of Mansfield who's going to be really grounding us in why that is important. So registration links are available on this URL that you see here, and we'll also put recording. So if you're interested and you miss it, the recording will be available. So with that, I want to turn it over to Marissa Gillette, the chairman of Pura, to talk a bit about their really exciting programs that are open to you all. So with no further ado, Marissa, it's all you. Thank you very much, Jessica, and thank you to Sustainable Connecticut for having us this morning. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is uh, Marissa Gillette, and I'm the chairman of the Connecticut Public Utilities Regulatory Authority. This morning, I uh, also have a number of authority staff with us uh, who are going to help me throughout the presentation, uh, and they're really the subject matter experts in some of these programs that we are here to talk to you about. So uh, with me this morning, we have Josh Ryer, who's our director of technical staff. We have uh, Stephanie Cohane, who is a supervisor in his office uh, focused on clean and affordable energy. And we also have two members of our uh, legislative and communication staff with us this morning, Taryn O'Connor and uh, Joe Cooper. So between the five of us, we look forward to uh, discussing these programs with you. Uh, if we can't get to all your questions this morning, um, we also have provided contact information in here, as well as a copy of the slides uh, because uh, the slides, as you'll see throughout, have a number of hyperlinked resources that we hope uh, that you have the opportunity to rely on in the future. Uh, so uh, I'm going to kick off this presentation this morning. Uh, we uh, want to focus on two programs in particular, uh, but before we get to that, I do want to um, kind of ground us in uh, the Equitable Modern Grid Initiative that the Authority uh, initiated a little over two years ago. Uh, because that uh, initiative has uh, borne out these two programs that we're here to talk to you about. And it also hopefully will preview uh, some additional programs coming down the pike that we hope that you uh, keep an eye out for. Um, uh, finally, we'll close by uh, sharing some of the other initiatives that PURE is working on, as well as addressing how you could engage directly with PURE. Uh, in the future, uh, if you want to affect how some of these program designs um, are ultimately uh, made and adopted. So to start, I want to take us back to October of 2019, which was a few months after uh, I took the position uh, at Pura. Um, the governor had recruited me from Maryland, where I had worked at a similar agency. Um, every state has their own version of Pura. They're often called public service commissions or public utility commissions, but they generally all, we generally all have the same, uh, you know, subject matter um, jurisdiction. Uh, we typically regulate electric, gas, water utilities that are investor owned. So in the state of Connecticut, we're talking about Eversource, United Illuminating, um, their gas affiliates, and uh, some of the big water companies like Aquarion and Connecticut Water. So when he brought me here to the state, 
uh, he had asked that I focus especially on modernizing the electric grid. Connecticut has really ambitious, um, really laudable uh, you know, greenhouse gas reduction goals. And we spend a lot of time focused on uh, how we can green our energy supply, which is incredibly important. But the piece that's less frequently discussed is how do we ensure that the distribution grid, so the poles and wires that you see outside of your window, how do we make sure that the distribution grid is reliable enough uh, to deliver this green energy? Um, because as we increasingly uh, encourage folks to electrify, whether it's their transportation or their heating and cooling, um, as we increasingly rely on the, the electric grid, we need to make sure that that grid, which is hundreds of years old in some cases, we need to make sure that it is ready to uh, accept um, all this ambitious uh, policy uh, from greening the supply. So in October of 2019, what we did was we announced our framework for how Pura was going to focus on modernizing the electric grid to make sure that we could um, deliver on the state's goals. And uh, what it did was uh, we, we launched this initiative focused on four specific objectives. Um, the objectives that you see on the screen, these are things that we have pulled from legislation uh, or from um, guidance that the, that the governor has handed down through executive orders. And uh, they may seem intuitive, especially to folks that are familiar with this space. Um, but if you are, if you've ever interacted with a utility commission before, be it in Connecticut or another jurisdiction, uh, you find that looking at uh, initiatives and projects and, and proceedings through the lens of these objectives is not uh, a common way for a utility commission to approach things. So we wanted to level set with our stakeholders, which include utilities, um, uh, consumer council, others like uh, DEEP. We wanted to level set and make sure that everyone is on the same page that as we embarked on this initiative, uh, the four objectives shown on the screen had to be front and center in terms of designing any programs that came out of this. Uh, so, um, those have uh, found a common home and, and framework in our program designs. Uh, whenever there is a conflict between a program design element, we find ourselves returning to these objectives to make sure that, uh, that the design is furthering as many of these as possible. So you may think, okay, well, what do you mean by grid mod? Um, and uh, the reality of the situation is there could be hundreds, if not thousands of different ways that we could approach the need to modernize our grid. And uh, in what we did was we carved out 11 uh, topics to start with. Um, the first six that you're seeing on the screen here were our first wave of dockets. Uh, everything that Pura does is through what's called a docket. Um, a, we're a quasi-judicial agency, much like akin to the operations of a judiciary. So when we undertake an investigation, it is through a docketed proceeding. And the first six that we undertook um, are shown here on the screen, uh, which is why we've made more progress on these six than the others I'm about to show you. The two that we're here to talk to you about today are storage and uh, light duty uh, zero emission vehicles. So I'm gonna um, uh, leave those to Stephanie and Josh, uh, but the others that you see on the screen <clears throat> Um, include AMI, which are things like smart meters, uh, ways that will facilitate the grid, um, uh, interconnecting distributed energy resources like solar, um, and uh, making sure that customers have the, uh, the granular data in their hands that they need to make educated decisions about uh, their energy usage. Um, just yesterday, we announced the launch of our innovation pilots uh, docket. Uh, this would be something that we'd be happy to come talk to you about at another time. Uh, if you're familiar at all with the concept of a regulatory sandbox, uh, it's essentially an opportunity for uh, third parties uh, to either come in on their own or in partnership with a utility to propose an innovative solution to solving uh, a grid need. And uh, you know the, the energy industry is not exactly known for its innovation. So we have put a specific focus on making sure um, that we are opening up uh, those opportunities. And uh, last on the screen, we see interconnection standards. Um, so uh, while this can seem very uh, dry, it's critically important 
uh, to making sure that once we are launching distributed energy resources or uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, um, the interconnection standards are what focuses on making sure the utilities are processing those requ requests in a timely manner uh, so that we can begin taking advantage of the services that they provide. Um, and then the top of this list is energy affordability. This, is, uh, this was deliberately the first track that we undertook because it is um, of such critical importance when we're in a state that already has the highest electricity rates on a per kilowatt hour basis in the continental United States. We have to be very focused um, as we undertake these grid mod efforts uh, we have to be very focused on the cost of all of these. And I think Josh will talk to you about how uh, in the energy storage docket, we were able to do some um, uh, innovative program design work um, to make sure that the program is delivering uh, more benefits than costs, even on an extremely um, conservative uh, outlook on, on that cost effectiveness calculation. Um, so the uh, additional topics that we have uh, we have now launched and are underway um, are the ones that you're seeing on the screen here. Um, I draw your attention. We get, we're getting a lot of uh, discussion with municipalities around the resilience and reliability standards, um, looking at the types of programs um, that utilities have historically relied on, uh, such as vegetation management, and and trying to steer them in the direction of considering uh, more. Um, uh, more holistic solutions, we'll say, to uh, reliability issues that are confronting us. Um, so I, uh, the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Stephanie here um, is, as I mentioned, there could have been hundreds, if not thousands, of different tracks of grid mod. Uh, and we found that very quickly right off the bat. If you're thinking of the timeline that I mentioned, we launched this in October of 2019. Um, just a couple months later, COVID hit, and just a couple months after that, Tropical Storm Isaias hit. Um, so it, what we found um, it was that as we were launching uh, some of these other uh, investigations into the utilities storm response, or how we were directing the utilities to work with their customers during COVID, um, what we've been, the, the bottom line is we've been finding through those um, either surprise <laughs> investigations or um, planned investigations like the new tariff designs the legislature asked us to adopt. What we've been able to do through uh, the equitable modern grid proceeding is make sure that the objectives we set out there, as well as the programs that we have launched, uh, are launched in a, uh, and designed in a way um, that complement all the other work that we're doing. Uh, and again, that sounds very intuitive. Um, but I think, you know, as we took a step back and we're looking at the progress Connecticut has made to date in its energy sector, one of the things that we struggled with is we've got like really great policies, um, but they're, they're a little bit piecemeal and don't always um, work together in, in a way that um, furthers the objectives of the state. So uh, there are a couple of concrete examples of that we can talk about, um, such as making sure that uh, that the rules around um, siting solar on your roof allow you to account for the possibility that your house is going to electrify and add electric vehicle chargers, for example. So um, we can get into those examples. And right now, I'm um, really happy to turn this over to Stephanie Cohane, who's going to talk about the light duty electric vehicle charging program. Um, and uh, then we will uh, move over to Josh Ryer to talk about our electric storage program. Stephanie? Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, uh, having us. It's great to see that there's interest in um, what Pure is doing and hopefully for, uh, interest in um, taking advantage of some of these programs that we're going to cover this morning. So again, my name is Stephanie Cohen. I lead the Clean and Affordable Energy Group here at Pura, um, and I'm going to talk through the EV charging program um, that we established last summer. So next slide, please. Great, thanks. So the EV charging program is a statewide program. It provides incentives for electric vehicle supply equipment, which is a technical term. We also kind of refer to it as EVSD or basically the charging infrastructure and accompanying rate design offerings for program participants. We launched this as a nine year program beginning January 1st of this year. And this program is administered 
um, by the regulated electric distribution companies, as the chairman mentioned, which is kind of purest purview. So that's Eversource Energy or UI, um, United Illuminated Company, depending on your, your service territory. And the program offers incentives to support EV charging across essentially five different kind of market segments which I'll uh, kind of talk through at a high level here. So just the, what are those market segments or how do we think about um, this program and designing um, program offerings? We have kind of residential single family uh, on one side as well as participants from multi-unit dwellings. Um, there's a kind of a segment for workplace and light duty fleet level two or um, public, charge, uh, public direct current fast charging or DCSC. That also has kind of its, its own uh, category, as well as public level two destination chargers, which you may have in your communities or um, see out and about. Um, notably, I just wanted to mention this program is focused on supporting charging um, infrastructure for light duty fleet electrification. So PR is also examining strategies to optimize integration of medium and heavy duty electric vehicles in a separate docket. And that is including looking at um, uh, electric transit and school buses. Next slide, please. So before we really get into kind of the details of program implementation and participation, I thought it might be useful to just quickly cover the program objectives that PURE established with input from stakeholders specifically for this electric vehicle charging program. So, and I'm sure these are familiar to this group, but one of the primary objectives um, is to enable Connecticut's, <clears throat> excuse me, existing commitment to the Zero Emission Vehicle Memorandum of Understanding, or ZEV MOU, the Connecticut is part of um, 10 states, and our kind of share of that in reaching that goal um, roughly equates to deploying 125,000 to 150,000 electric vehicles across the state by 2025. So that was kind of a really kind of guiding um, benchmark um, in terms of, as the chairman mentioned, there's a lot of great um, kind of goals and commitments and policies uh, in the state, but how can through um, our work in regulating the electric utilities kind of support um, the implementation and the achievement of those goals. We also looked at integrating um, electric vehicle charging technologies in a manner that realized potential electric system benefits of um, increasing transportation electrification, and, and those include you know, distribution system benefits and also obviously the, the, the greenhouse gas benefits um, of uh, transitioning away from fossil fuel use for um, transportation. Uh, another kind of key tenet in our objective is focused, uh, that's uh, really important, is focused on achieving an equitable transition to the wide-scale deployment of electric vehicles uh, so that all communities benefit and um, you know, rec in recognition that, uh, you know, depending on where you live or, or how you, your driving pattern, not all customers certainly have um, access to uh, a personal vehicle, for example. And that's why some of the work that we're doing in the kind of medium and heavy duty space is also kind of um, part of the full picture and complementing the offerings. Um, so, and lastly, um, another program objective is really just kind of tying back to what the chairman kind of covered in her intro of making sure that this program is, in, is supporting um, the overall objectives of the equitable modern grid. Next slide, please. So, so really kind of the, the next layer down from those uh, high level uh, ZEV MOU deployment targets that I mentioned, we really guided um, the program is guided by specific deployment targets um, that are indicated in order to meet the state's greenhouse gas reduction targets, which um, the Governor's Council on Climate Change did some analysis, um, you might all be familiar with, that looked at kind of an, a key assumption of reaching 500,000 um, electric uh, light duty EVs deployed by 2030 in order to meet um, greenhouse gas uh, emission targets statewide. So we kind of use that 2030 target as another uh, benchmark looking out at this program, again, as I mentioned, as a nine-year program. So we um, utilized a, a tool available from the Department of Energy called the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Projection Tool, or EVI ProLite, um, with stakeholder input on kind of how to uh, design and apply it to Connecticut-based um, assumptions. And this is how we kind of came up with these uh, EVSE deployment targets for each program segment that I mentioned. 
And it's really based on the utilities achieving these targets within a three-year program cycle, which um, Josh and I will kind of cover as part of a key kind of program design of both the EV and energy storage programs. So you can see here, um, there's, uh, there's still more work to be done in terms of just determining specific goals, for example, for the multi-unit dwelling uh, units. So that's, you know, kind of multi-residents um, living in multi-unit dwellings of about, I think it's the cutoff is four or more is considered multi-unit dwellings, at least for the purposes of this program. And there really was not a lot of information and data available on existing infrastructure there. And so that's something that we have to kind of take back and refine um, as we look into the future and developing future targets. Next slide, please. So going through the actual kind of program um, offerings and how to participate. So first looking at the residential single family customers. Um, so residents who are seeking to install a level two charger at their single family residence are eligible for up to a $500 rebate to install what we're calling a network level two charger essentially that has the, the Wi-Fi connectivity and it's able to um, talk to, for lack of a better term, um, the, the utility. The utilities are able to kind of recognize that um, charger on their system as well as up to a $500 rebate for electrical wiring upgrades that may be needed at the home in order to accommodate the um, level two charger installation. So looking at this kind of, again, holistically in order to mitigate potential negative impacts of you know, charging patterns on the grid, um, participants will, uh, who are participants who are receiving an incentive are required to enroll in what we're calling a managed charging program. So for 2022, what that essentially looks like is the utilities are implementing a demand response program and folks may be familiar with that kind of general program design um, in the context of the energy efficiency offerings in the state. Um, so in this electric vehicle context, electric vehicle charging, a demand response program aims to encourage participants to shift their EV charging usage um, to off-peak times during specifically a four-month summer period, which is when the grid is um, experiences the highest uh, peak demand uh, for the system so to try to minimize um, those peak demand costs and, and shift charging to off-peak times. Um, so under this managed charging or demand response uh, program, participants who opt out of two or fewer events per month that the utility would kind of call as part of this um, program participation um, are eligible to receive $50 for that month. So up to $200 per year because it's over a four month uh, summer program over the summer. Now, if you are not in a uh, position, residents are not in a position to needing to purchase a uh, level two network charger, for example, there are also kind of these one-time enrollment incentives for the managed charging program. So for example, if you have a vehicle that has onboard telematics that the uh, utility is designated as compatible with their um, systems for, for kind of uh, demand response participation, there's a um, $100 enrollment incentive available, as well as if you have a, if you have purchased prior to the start of this program, a level two charger for home use that doesn't have that network connectivity, um, there's a, a device um, depending on your jurisdiction, um, that Eversource offers a device that is free of charge, and then UI um, is planning to utilize its advanced metering infrastructure um, to allow participation in that program. So there are kind of different options depending on when and where you're, you're coming into this um, program participation. Uh, next slide, please. So focusing us uh, aside from the kind of residential single family context for all of their program segments, um, essentially the EV charging program adopts a make ready model. And, and what that means is that utilities will invest um, through this program in the infrastructure required to enable charging from their distribution system up to the EVSC or the charger itself with maximum incentives as you can see on this slide capped at a per site basis. Um, we do have um, additional incentives available because there's kind of like two tiers. There's a baseline incentive and then additional uh, incentives were established for um, hosting 
EVSC in underserved communities. And so how that um, term is defined, at least for this program, we kind of looked at the varying uh, definitions um, and statutory terms used throughout the state. And so we're including the list of distressed municipalities. This is a um, Department of Economic and Community Development um, kind of identifies and tracks on an annual basis or an environmental justice community as defined as Connecticut state statute or in the, um, the multi-unit dwelling kind of program segment, public housing authorities um, that meet the Connecticut state statute definition would also be considered underserved communities. Um, and there's a link on the um, uh, Pura EV charging program website to, to a, a deep kind of page actually that has a, a nice map kind of shows you where all these um, communities are across the state, which might be uh, useful in terms of planning. So just to talk a minute about the uh, site host requirements and, and how to kind of participate to receive um, uh, incentives listed on the slide here. Uh, a site host, to be considered a site host, you must either kind of own the land, have a lease of five or more years for that site that the chargers will be installed in, or obtain written consent from a land owner. There also is a commitment from site host to operate and maintain this installed charging infrastructure for a minimum of five years. And again, we want to make sure that um, these, invested, the in, these investments through this program are not kind of ending up as um, uh, straighted costs later on. Um, and there's also a kind of a, a commitment to having the utilities be able to access the, um, at an aggregate scale, charger usage data to understand, you know, charging patterns and, and plan accordingly across their service territory. Uh, next slide, please. So those last two slides kind of talked through the specific uh, incentives for installing EVSB uh, infrastructure across the state in these different market segments. Now on the rate design piece, Currently, um, Eversource and UI offer uh, a rate specifically for separately metered EV charging stations uh, in an effort to mitigate the impact of demand charges. And this is kind of particularly relevant for a DCFC station um, that currently doesn't have uh, utilization rates that uh, are sufficient to kind of offset these demand charges that the um, account holders of the, of the charging station are paying through their electric bill, for example. So if this is something that um, is applicable to your situation and interested, definitely inquire with your utility. It's called an EV rate rider. They also have some information on their website about this. You kind of have to basically opt into this um, rate design structure. So that's kind of what's available currently. We're also looking at um, developing a longer term solution essentially that looks at the, the combination of volumetrics, so based on usage rates, as well as the demand charge, um, changing kind of based on a scale basis on how utilization of the charging station increases over time. Again, recognizing that in the early years, there might be kind of spikes in usage and, and therefore demand and, and cost in the, in the electricity rate, but that you kind of need to allow for this, this ramp up period to occur as more um, electric vehicles are on the road and are charging out of uh, home locations. So this is something that um, is, is the utilities are working on and will be submitting a proposal to us um, next month for kind of this uh, ongoing uh, review through stakeholders. Uh, I wanna just mention really quickly, I see I skipped over on the residential side, there are options currently for uh, participants, residents to participate in a whole house time of use rate. Um, again, that's something that you need to opt into by contacting your electric utility. Um, and that could be beneficial if you are planning to charge uh, an electric vehicle at home again on those off peak designated times. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I alluded to this earlier, but essentially the a program review process. So um, kind of how we got here, as I, I mentioned, we had a, through the Equitable Modern Grid Initiative, an initial docket that established the program parameters and design of this EV charging program that um, 
a, a came to a conclusion uh, last summer when the authority issued its uh, decision directing utilities to implement this program. But there also are many um, kind of opportunities for uh, continuous feedback and improvement built in. So we have what's called an annual review cycle. Uh, we had that first annual review cycle last year. The docket number that you can see is up here, 210806, and we're gearing up to start our actual next um, annual review, which would be for the, this first year, um, <clears throat> which I'll talk about, I think it's on the next slide. So there's kind of those annual opportunities to, for the utilities or other stakeholders to identify to Pura adjustments that may need to be made uh, to the program. But then we've also, built in as this is a nine-year program and obviously recognizing that especially in the um, electric vehicle technology advancements uh, kind of considerations things are changing and improving and we need to make sure that the program is adaptable to that so these three-year program review cycles so the next one or the first one would be in 2024 kind of looks at the program um, more holistically ensuring you know, rate payer value is being met as well as adherence to the program objectives I mentioned before. Um, in line with the chairman's kind of uh, plug for participation in, in our public processes, there are um, opportunities for um, members of the public, any other stakeholders to participate in both of these um, processes. Next slide. So yeah, this one, so this talks a little bit more about if you're interested in participating, the kind of opportunities here. So as part of the uh, uh, some, uh, Paris order last summer, we directed EverSource and UI to reconvene what's called a managed charging working group. They are working with um, other state agencies, the industry, um, and others to kind of develop and refine that managed charging component I mentioned before. And so they have, reconvene those conversations earlier this year. If you're interested in participating, definitely reach out to um, uh, the utilities that have their contact information on the next slide. But that also this program review uh, period I, I mentioned, we're starting up and, and this year we'll specifically look at these, um, any recommendations from the working group to revise managed charging program requirements in future years, um, as well as a proposed uh, tariff for DC FCs and level two light duty fleets, again, that kind of longer term solution that I uh, was talking about, as well as a proposed EV only tariff offering for multi unit dwellings. We recognize through the course of the program there's this really you know, difficult um, split incentive uh, issue that there is, you know, it's not unique to electric vehicles, but between the tenants and, and um, landlords, oftentimes in terms of barriers in participating in some of the, whether it's energy efficiency or in this case, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And so we've had the utilities kind of look at this issue in greater detail and see if there's a way through a rate design solution to address some of those issues to allow for greater participation um, from the multi-unit dwelling in accessing um, funds for installing EV chargers. Uh, I think that, oh, there's one more bullet here. Okay, so utility leasing program. Yeah, so those two kind of address, uh, came to address this uh, this issue of ensuring that multi-unit dwellings are participating uh, in these uh, program offerings that we have available. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I, I mentioned, Eversource and UI both have their own EV charging program websites, which are um, great resources. We also have a uh, charging web page on our Pure of homepage. Uh, thanks to the comms team for really kind of standing this up uh, in, in record time here. And um, on our page, we have some links to the utilities um, information as well. If you're you know not able to kind of navigate it, I will call out that there's what's called a qualified products list, essentially um, a list of acceptable EVSD chargers that in order to um, obtain an incentive through this program, you kind of have to select from one of those. Um, and so that is a, a kind of a key component in, in planning. So make sure you check out that uh, list online if you're interested in kind of seeking incentives. We also have the contact information for both utilities here, as well as Pira's um, Consumer Affairs Unit, if you have, um, you know, matters that um, Pure would need to follow up on. So I think I will uh, leave it at that. Hopefully I didn't go too long and turn it back to the chairman.
Thank you, Stephanie. So uh, we are going to transition into another program that, uh, that PR has launched through its Expo Modern Grid uh, initiative. And uh, at the conclusion of this, uh, we're certainly open to questions on, on any of the material presented. So I'm going to turn it to uh, Josh Ryder to talk about the Energy Storage Solutions Program that was also launched on January 1st of this year. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Chairman, and thank you again uh, to Sustainable CT for having us today. You can go to the next slide. Great. So uh, as the Chairman already mentioned, um, the program was launched on, on January 1st. Um, it's called the Energy Storage Solutions Program, uh, abbreviated ESS in some places. And it's a new nine-year program uh, and what you'll see with kind of what we're trying to do with, uh, to the extent we can to a lot of our program designs, we're trying to um, signal kind of a long-term opportunity to the market. Um, and really that was um, in large part enabled by what I'll talk about in the next uh, slide, um, which was Public Act uh, 2153. Um, but this program specifically has a, um, a, a goal of deploying 580 megawatts of uh, electric storage um, through the end of 2030. And you can see in this chart that um, similar to the EV charging program, we've broken it up into um, kind of three year cycles um, that really ramps up. Hopefully over time, the costs continue to come down for storage. Um, and so we can leverage that reduced cost um, to deploy more uh, and to be more of our goals. Um, and uh, the last thing on this slide, sorry, I almost, I almost uh, flipped to the uh, next slide too quickly, um, is that this program actually uniquely in what one of the important things uh, included in uh, Public Act 20, uh, one of the many important things in, included in Public Act 2153 was actually that it directly asked us to look at um, uh, folks like the Green Bank and whether or not we should uh, use them as a third party administrator for this program. So the Green Bank actually um, will be the administrator of this program, along with the electric utility companies that we, um, we regulate, as has been mentioned a couple of times already. Um, but really, the Green Bank um, is kind of the one that, that's housing the, the program design and, and kind of where the program is going through for at least initial applications. We're talking about kind of how, how to navigate the programs today. Uh, next slide. Great. So I've already uh, at least twice uh, mentioned Public Act uh, 2153. Uh, it set a, a deployment target for Connecticut of 1,000 megawatts of energy storage by 2031 or the end of 2030, however you want to say that. Um, section 2, there's, uh, if, um, if I'm not mistaken, there's three sections in that Public Act. Um, the first one sets the goal. The second section actually authorized Pura um, to do something like the Energy Storage Solutions Program. Um, and so what was really important to us, when if you think back to the last slide, I said this program is designed to hit at least 580 megawatts of, um, of storage deployment by, uh, the, by 2031. We wanted to make sure Section 3 actually gives some authorization to DEEP um, to uh, to procure storage. So we wanted to make sure not only we were doing our fair share, um, but that we were incrementally um, moving the ball forward to meet that goal of 1,000 megawatts. Um, the second part of the slide here talks about our objectives. You've heard us talk about it a couple of times now. It's really important to us um, that we ground everything that we do in the equitable modern grid objectives that the chairman started with. Um, but then also the specific objectives of the different topics that we're talking about. And really most importantly, tying that into the public policy of Connecticut and stakeholder uh, input. And, and how do we make those work for, for the people that are actually gonna be deploying and using these programs uh, and benefiting from them. So we had seven, we established seven uh, objectives. Uh, I've kind of summarized them into to four buckets. Uh, one of our main objectives always as the, the economic regulator of the public utilities is to look at rates and cost effectiveness. So our, you know, the first one listed here is cost effectiveness for all rate payers. And I will talk about that a little bit more at, at the end. Uh, and then, but the second one was also, I mean, we already, uh, the chairman already mentioned Tropical Storm Isaias earlier is really the ability for storage, especially uh, paired with solar 
to provide customers with resilience during outages. Um, we're going to see that more and more, unfortunately, um, with extreme weather events. So, so obviously, we've heard from um, stakeholders across the, the state that this is really an important objective right now. And then just building off of that, it's even more important. All of this is even more important in vulnerable communities. Um, and then lastly, um, just really, I, I spoke to this earlier in the kind of the long-term vision, the nine-year program, but the sustained development of the storage industry. Um, so yes, come to Connecticut, um, but we're not, this isn't a program that might change next year or it's gonna go away. Um, well, there might be changes, I should, I should say that it, within the design, but it's not gonna go away uh, and it's certainly gonna be available for, for nine years. Um, next slide. Great, so there's, there's two real um, components to this program. Uh, in the form of incentive payments or, or however you want to phrase it. Um, so the first is an upfront incentive. Uh, and we heard from not only the storage industry, but um, uh, advocates uh, that it's really important to have both uh, an upfront incentive and a performance incentive. That upfront incentive helps with kind of the financing of the system, the business model of the developers, um, in overcoming some of the, the deployment barriers and that performance incentive, uh, and, and Stephanie talked about this in the context of the EV uh, charging program, it helps make sure that we're maximizing the value of the storage system to the grid and to ratepayers. So I'll talk first about the upfront incentives for residential customers, and then I'll talk about it for non-residential customers or commercial industrial customers. So there's an upfront uh, incentive um, You'll see the baseline incentive is uh, for most customers, obviously. It's based on, it, for those that are familiar with um, solar, you might be thinking that that dollar per kilowatt hour is a number where it'd be based on production. It's actually kilowatt hour capacity. So it's how many kilowatt hours can you store? So for, exa for example, I think in the docket, we looked at a battery um, that had 10 kilowatt hours of capacity. So just to give you some, some context there. Um, so then the Green Bank is really the one that handles the upfront incentive portion of the program, um, and they will calculate based on kind of the size of the program and all the information that's submitted to the application, what that upfront incentive that a residential customer would get, but it's capped at $7,500, just to be, be clear. And then you'll see here that there's two adders. Um, and what's really, what we're trying to do, the, the chairman spoke to earlier, kind of, we have all sorts of great programs in the state for clean energy and the deployment of green energy, um, but we don't, uh, so often, uh, they're not as coordinated as, as they could be um, to, to kind of maximize value and just to streamline things for, for people that are participating. So one of the nice things here is um, the underserved community adder and the low income adder actually use the same eligibility criteria as the new residential solar program, which we're not talking about here today, but we've mentioned solar programs a couple of times already. Um, but so there's two adders. So if you uh, live in an underserved community, uh, which we defined as kind of an economic, um, um, economically distressed municipality, and there's the, the Connecticut DECD list, um, then you get one that's that's a little bit higher of an upfront incentive. And then if you specifically meet some income requirements, um, specifically that you are uh, income below 60% of the state median income, um, then you will um, obviously receive the, the highest one. Um, and then one just important note here, a requirement for both this upfront incentive and for um, the, the, the commercial industrial one is that you have to discharge your battery uh, evenly over three to five, eight, 8 p.m. in certain months. We already, Stephanie already mentioned the fact that the summer is really when a lot of the electric system costs are, or what it's driven by that summer peak. And so we have a requirement to help maximize the value of these systems that you have to evenly distribute your, um, the dispatch of the battery from three to eight uh, for those months with, with a caveat that I'll talk about in, in a bit. We can go to the next slide. Great, so uh, not a lot different here with uh, commercial and industrial customers, uh, except for the incentive level, instead of being based on uh, whether or not you uh, are eligible for one of those adders that I talked about, 
is actually based on the size of the customer and the incentive gets smaller based on the, uh, the larger the customer. Um, and then there is a project cap, but it's only at 50% of the total project cap. So there wasn't a nominal uh, project cap. And I, as I said, there's, a, there's this passive, it's called a passive dispatch um, setting or requirement from three to eight in those key months. Next slide. So I mentioned that there's a key caveat. So uh, the summer months are really when we're capturing a lot of the value from discharging the battery. Um, the, and so we have a, a requirement, like I said, where batteries have to discharge evenly over, from three to eight over the summer. But in addition to that, we, we, can, we can do better than that, essentially. We have a good sense based on historical data, whether when the peak, peak hours are gonna be in the year. It's usually in the last couple of years, it's been five to 6 p.m. Uh, over the summer. Um, and so we know if we can target not only um, the right range of hours, but the specific hour that's the highest hour in each year, and we can actually reduce that, that actually reduces the amount of capacity that the whole region needs to, to use and then ultimately buy in the future. And so that actually saves us the most money if we can get even more targeted. So we have a performance-based incentive that really tries to get at that. And what happens is, and you can see below, um, in the summer months, it's June through September. So the other one was June through August, it's June through September. And what will happen is the utilities will send your system and whether it's, it's you're operating it or whether it's a third party um, that's operating your battery for you, they will receive a signal. And then if you want to respond to it, you can. And then at the end of the season, they will average out how you performed, what your performance was for each of the events that they called. And they have, they have to call all of these events at least 24 hours in advance. They average your performance and then they multiply that by the incentive that's listed in that first table. So for example, in the first five years, if you average say 10 kilowatts of, of, of performance over the summer, that'd be a lot. Um, let's, let's say five uh, kilowatts. Um, over the summer, at the end of the summer, actually, uh, I believe it's 90 days, so the middle of October, you'll receive um, you'll receive a credit uh, that's in the form of five kilowatts times that 200 number, so a thousand thousand dollars. And the same is true for for the rest of those numbers. There, I'm not going to go over all of those in the interest of time. Um, but I will note we also it was really important for us um, to um, also have a winter season where we're peaking. Um, and I, I think probably all of us experienced um, the, the, the fact that prices went up over the, over the winter because of supply and natural gas largely drives our, our supply prices in the state. And so to the extent that we can help alleviate the need for natural gas in the first place, then battery storage will also help um, save ratepayers money. So it was important for us to, uh, when we were designing this program to have both a summer and a winter component to this performance-based incentive. Next slide. Great, so a, a lot of these slides are very similar to what Stephanie went over for the um, uh, EV charging program. So we already had a, a year one program review. So we authorized the program, then we reviewed to make sure everything was looked good. Um, we'll have an upcoming uh, annual review. And then we also have a three-year program cycle, just like Stephanie talked about. You can actually jump to the next slide. Uh, and then just a couple of things to, to flag in case uh, folks are interested in um, being uh, a participant or actively engaging in our, our docket or annual review process. We actually have some unique filings, much like the EV charging program docket um, but, and things that we want to look at this upcoming year. And a couple of things are, so I mentioned we want to do at least 580 megawatts in our program. And why I said it that way is because we actually really are only looking at grid or uh, sorry, customer cited uh, program or projects in the current program design. What we haven't quite fully incorporated yet are front of the meter or I, what I call here grid tied systems. So the program actually has the ability, the goal, the 580 is just for those customer cited um, systems. So there's actually an ability here for us to go beyond that with these additional systems. And then you'll also see um, the two other filings that the Green Bank uh, has with us is to really make sure we optimize not only the, the benefits 
to ratepayers, uh, but the emissions and the environmental benefits. So, so making sure we're, we're optimizing there. Um, and then also making sure that we're tying in with everything that Stephanie just walked through and all the programs there, making sure that both programs are, are coordinated and in, in building off of one another. And that's really what we'll do uh, in this annual review process that will start over the summer. Next slide. Great. So just uh, these are the, the resources. Um, the one thing I, I want to say uh, uh, here and, and what you'll see in um, in some of our materials, if you go through the decision, I, I mentioned a couple of times the importance of cost effectiveness. Um, and if, if for those that want to learn more about exactly what we looked at in cost effectiveness, you'd go to our um, or, or cost benefit testing, uh, cost benefit analysis for right. Um, is another way to, to say it. And if you want to look at some of that, you, you go to our website and look at the decision that we, we where we authorize this program. And there's a bunch of different uh, tests, cost effectiveness tests that are used in actually the energy efficiency world that we applied here. And I think one of the most notable ones and most important ones that we really honed in on is what's called this ratepayer impact measure. Um, and that actually indicates whether or not because of the program, whether or not other customers rates are going to be reduced. And what we saw in, in, in Green Bank analysis um, was that actually um, the ratio was 1.4, meaning that for this ratepayer impact measure, meaning that in fact all other ratepayers will benefit from the fact that that folks are participating in this program. So that's a pretty um, that's a pretty it, we haven't seen that elsewhere, and we haven't seen analysis uh, in this detail. And it really speaks to the the potential in Connecticut of this program and programs like it, but also uh, programs elsewhere across the country. So, so really exciting uh, there. And with that, I think that's the last slide. Great, I'll turn it back to the chairman. Thanks, Josh, and uh, thanks, Stephanie. So I'm gonna round out our presentation and then we're gonna open ourselves up to uh, questions. Um, we wanted to touch uh, briefly on a few other initiatives that we have going on that we think may be interesting um, to you uh, or your colleagues. Uh, the first uh, is something called performance-based regulation. Um, hearkening back to tropical storm Isaias again, uh, you may recall that after, um, after that tropical storm, the legislature convened a special session and ended up passing uh, what's colloquially known as the Take Back Our Grid Act. And that piece of legislation did a number of things, um, one of which was sent a signal uh, to PIRA that we needed to transition um, the way that we regulate utilities uh, away from what's um, historically called cost of service regulation, which is uh, used um, throughout the country and the world really for uh, over a hundred years. Uh, and, and the legislature, the legislature through this Take Back Our Credit Act has asked PIRA to look into transitioning to performance-based regulation or PBR. And uh, it's, um, uh, the concept is similar to what the name suggests. Uh, it, it, looks, it directs us to look into regulating these, util use, these utilities based on um, outcomes. So defining objectives and goals and working towards specific outcomes and, and, uh, in a way that you could incentivize the utility through a combination of um, both uh, financial incentives as well as financial penalties in order to drive towards an outcome that you coll uh, collectively establish. So uh, we've, we've just kicked off that docket. Um, we are envisioning a multi-year stakeholder process. Uh, about two weeks ago, we held a listening session. Uh, we had a good turnout from the public. Uh, we're taking feedback right now on uh, goals that folks have for uh, what they want their electric utilities to be able to do in the future. Um, and we have a stakeholder workshop coming up. So if you know that your municipality or that you individually uh, have a specific objective um, or an outcome that you wanna see from this proceeding, uh, that uh, we would welcome your feedback. Uh, we also wanted to uh, highlight the number of clean energy programs that, uh, that we've collectively alluded to during this presentation. Um, they each in their own right deserve, deserve a webinar and we've done um, some, we've put together some materials and recorded some videos uh, which are available through our website. Um, but uh, the, first, the first bullet on the screen refers to um, one of our other grid mod uh, tracks, specifically 
the one, it was the, the ninth track focused on looking at all of the distributed energy resource policies that we have in the state uh, and uh, taking the first step of um, compiling all of that progress and data into a centralized uh, a location um, that will be published on an annual basis so that we can evaluate you know, our progress toward achieving these goals. So we, uh, we recently issued the first report in that docket um, summarizing uh, data up through calendar year 2021. Uh, so that, that is hyperlinked here if you're curious to know um, how the state has done and performing on its uh, you know, uh, programs of the past, like virtual net metering, LREC, ZREC, things of that nature. And the reason I'm referring to those programs um, in the past tense is because if you weren't aware, the legislature directed PURA to establish um, successor programs. Uh, to virtual net metering, LRX, VRAC, and then on the residential side, um, RSIP. So PURA did complete that exercise. We have, uh, we have established those new programs. Um, they launched on January 1, so there was no interruption of service. Uh, and like I mentioned, there's a lot to unpack in, in both of those programs. So we have provided links to our website that has uh, material to share there. And then the last uh, bullet on the screen, of course, is um, our website on the Shared Clean Energy Facility Program. Uh, you might be familiar with this from other jurisdictions um, referring to it as, uh, uh, as community solar, or um, that's typically how it's referred to in, in other states. So uh, we have those links there. I, I think to the extent that uh, folks want to ask questions about those, we're, we're happy to entertain them. Um, uh, but um, finally, uh, and then again, welcome questions here. We just wanted to provide a little context for how you can engage with us moving forward. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more on this topic, um, we can refer you to uh, YouTube videos that we've recorded as well um, on uh, PURA 101 or how to engage with PURA. And just the snippet that I'd offer here is if you've been to one of those presentations that we've hosted, uh, you'll recall the, the extreme emphasis on seeking um, stakeholder feedback into our proceedings. As I mentioned at the outset, we are a quasi-judicial agency, which means that we can only make decisions based on the evidence that is put before us in one of these proceedings. So it's critically important that we receive feedback from folks who are interested in informing how a program is designed in the first instance or how it is modified or adapted during one of these annual program reviews. So uh, I know I saw at least one person in the chat when we joined mentioned that they're looking forward to, I think it was New Haven, looking forward to signing up for some of UI's uh, DCFC uh, rebates uh, in the near future. So if, if you or, or any of you on, the, uh, on this webinar have that opportunity to participate in the EV program, or the battery storage program or anything else that we've discussed here today. Uh, and you have suggestions for what went right, um, what could be improved. Those are the things that we would take into account when we're conducting those annual program reviews. Um, so uh, we look forward to your questions, not only today, but um, your feedback as you begin to pr hopefully participate in these programs. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Jessica, and we are available for questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Joshua. Stephanie, really appreciate your presentation today. So we have plenty of time for questions. So if you can feel free to pop those questions in the chat, or we are a smaller group. You can take yourself off mute, show your face, and, and ask your question as well. So what are you wondering? insert Jeopardy music here. <laughs> it was a very comprehensive program, so it's possible there aren't any questions, but this is your time. You have uh, the Pura representatives, a captive audience, Well, I have a question. Let's say you are a municipality and you're a volunteer on the sustainability team and you want to get started with these programs. What's the first step? 
Great question. Um, I'd say that the, the first step would be to check out the PIRA website that we've provided through, um, through these materials. We've tried on the website to provide um, vi short video clips introducing you to the program. Uh, and more importantly, we've summarized the contact information for the program administrators. So, you know, after it kind of leaves PIRA, right? Like we at PIRA are designing this program. Um, we're directing the utilities to implement. After it leaves uh, our um, safe space, if you will, uh, it's up to the program administrators to faithfully implement this. So as Josh mentioned, the Green Bank is our program administrator uh, for uh, the storage program um, in concert with the utilities. And then on the EV side, the utilities are administering that program directly. So the EV program, um, the utilities have been putting on some evening webinars uh, to uh, for their specific audience, because as Stephanie walked through, there's five different areas of this program. So there was or, or is upcoming a webinar um, targeted specifically for uh, communities. So um, perhaps before we uh, before we hang up, we can um, get the that link. Stephanie, anything to add there? Yeah, thanks for that, Chairman. I did check. So if you you can start by going because there's you know links everywhere, right? But if you go to our EV charging program webpage, from there we've kind of um, have a, a summary of quick links, and one of which is the utilities kind of webinar calendar. And so I just checked it this morning. Last week, actually, they had a webinar for um, potential municipal participation in the program. They have posted uh, past recordings of those presentations. It just happened last week, so I would um, say, you know, kind of check back and hopefully that recording is posted soon. Um, but there are other um, webinar opportunities that the utilities are kind of doing their own version of a roadshow, um, and they might be doing some in-person events as allowable as well. Um, but the kind of resources of past events are certainly available there. Um, I would, in addition to, you know, kind of just familiarizing yourself with what the program options are, there is, um, I would take a look at that qualified product list, basically like which chargers are um, eligible to be to receive these incentives. Um, certainly, there, depending on the situation, there might be, you know, interest in, in a municipality serving as a site host. Another potential avenue is um, working with a third party uh, vendor, like of a electric vehicle charging infrastructure. I know there's some um, direct kind of uh, involvement or, or um, participation from that side that might be of interest if there isn't that kind of um, appetite, if you will, for kind of serving as a site host is, um, as, a, as a municipality. But that kind of opportunity for partnership, that is definitely, if that's something of interest, I would say reach out to the utility um, who can help kind of provide some of those connections. And then take a look at the application um, too that's available on the website just, you know, before you and get to the place where you're um, applying for the program incentives, you want to kind of just make sure that everything um, goes through and, and is kind of compatible with the, with the program requirements. So. And just to add one, one last thing, step 1B maybe is, um, is really, especially with the storage program, is you're going to need to, to find a trusted contractor that can walk you through it. Um, and with the storage programs, especially with residential customers, it's going to be important to understand how much of your load you can actually, so whether it's, you know, your refrigerator and your washer or just your refrigerator, that a battery store, that a battery will be able to back up during a power outage. So finding a contractor that you're comfortable with that understands the program is going to be really important. Um, and so I'd encourage folks to go to the, the Green Bank website. I'll pop it in the chat. Um, and, and look at the list of, of qualified uh, partners through the program, and then to, to contact them and to and talk to a few of them, right? Um, just to get a sense of their understanding of, of the program and make sure they understand your needs. Thank you all. Questions from the audience, anything coming to mind? Well, I have another one. This is great. Um, <laughs> so the municipalities, it seems like there's 
at least two avenues. One is they're going to implement these programs in their own domain, so at municipal buildings, properties they own, but also they can serve as a facilitator to help spread the word and, and showcase. Can you talk a bit more about how you might envision the, the municipal role in the outreach and the education components for both programs? Fantastic point, because as you mentioned, there are um, portions of the program, particularly in the EV, that have program design elements targeted to the municipalities themselves. For example, um, installing EVSE uh, and rate design options uh, that facilitate the transition of the municipality's fleet to electric vehicles. So that's you know definitely one of the direct participation routes that municipalities could could look into through that program. Um, on the, on the, uh, in terms of serving as a role or a conduit to uh, get this information out, not to just residents in your community, um, but also to non-residential customers in your community, whether they're small businesses or if you have um, uh, you know, even larger uh, industrial uh, partners, that both of the programs that we've talked about today um, have uh, potential offerings that are applicable across the board. The behind the meter storage program that Josh talked about um, uh, has offerings for residential, for non-residential customers, uh, the same with, with Stephanie. So those range of incent this incentives have ranges associated with them, um, depending on the type of customer, uh, but there's something for everyone here, um, we, we hope. And uh, if there's not, again, that's feedback we'd like through the, the annual um, program review design. So um, the outreach and, and education role that the municipalities themselves could play uh, is huge. Um, we're trying to you know, make ourselves available through a roadshow. We've had, um, we're, we've recorded uh, materials and all of those are designed so that the municipality could pick them up um, and utilize them uh, yourselves. Um, if there's, a, uh, you know, anything that uh, folks find through doing that, that would be um, helpful uh, for us to expand on. Um, we're certainly, you know, open to that feedback and maybe I'll check with Josh and Stephanie if I've, I've missed anything there. Yeah, for storage, one of the key components, especially in what we defined as vulnerable communities, um, the Green Bank actually has a targeted marketing and kind of solarized style for the folks that are familiar with solarized uh, campaigns. So I would reach out directly to them to see what resources they have, what's been successful in other uh, towns, um, and if they, you know, anything they suggest. And I'm sure, you know, we're always happy to, to I don't want to, I shouldn't commit us all. We're all always happy to give presentations. I'm sure they would be as well. Um, so I wouldn't hesitate to reach out to the Green Bank directly. Thank you. Last call for questions from the audience. Anything coming to mind? All right, well, I want to thank our friends at Pura for spending so much time with us this morning. You've been so generous with, uh, with your time and expertise. Thank you very much to those on the line. We will be sending out a recording as well as the slide deck so you have access to all of the links that were shared. And if you do have questions, um, comments, feedback for Pura, please reach out. And thank you for joining us this morning. So thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.